our elder, our scholar, and a multi-genius. And I ask that you help me by standing and giving a round of applause for our scholar, Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you very much. I'm pleased with the invitation. We have a lot of work to do, and we want to go directly to the work. I have often said, history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. The role of history is to tell a people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. But most important, the role of history properly learned tells the people where they still must go and what they still must be. Something has happened to us that we pay little attention to and we are forever knocking at the door of other people, barring cultures, barring ways of life, inferior to the ones we lost. When you see the strongest thing about a people, look on the flip side and you'll see the weakest. The strongest thing about African people in relationship to other people was their ability to be hospitable to strangers. The weakest thing about African people is that they did not understand the intention of those strangers. And those strangers disrupted our society from Western Asia for 3,000 years before the Europeans. We are always adopting people and following after people who don't know where they are going. And we are always equating ourselves with other people, not knowing that it is not a matter of being better or worse, it is a matter of being different. Now I have such for the definition of African people in the history of the world most of my life, starting with my such in the Bible and with my great grandmother, who I love as a deity, even to the point if faith was kind enough ever to show me the true face of God, and it turned out to be Grandmother Mary, all I'm gonna do is to shrug my shoulders and say, Grandma, of all the tricks you played, played on me, this is the greatest. I suspected that you was God all along. <laughs> what we failed to do is to see greatness and godliness in ourselves because we have been programmed into someone else's incubator. When you are born into one cultural incubator with a special kind of cultural chemistry that goes with your makeup, your personality, and your surroundings, and when you are taking out of that and placed into another culture incubator, alien to your culture, you take on traits you never had before. Some time ago, some meat-clad women, all perfumed down and jewelry down, middle class and up, whatever that is, asked me to speak on the historical origins of black teenage pregnancy. 
They expected me to come and hang the black man out to dry. Condemn him down through the ages and I didn't even mention him. Because there was no black teenage pregnancy in Africa. There was no wife beaters in Africa. There was no men referring to women by the B word in Africa. Then where then did we pick up these traits? If it didn't come out of our original incubator, we picked it up in the second incubator because the condition in the second incubator influenced our makeup. We became things most unlike ourselves. Now my mental notes for this lecture is called Law and Order in African Societies Before and After Invasion and Slavery. And I'm pulling on the fact that I have traveled in nearly every country in Africa except South Africa. And I have lived among people so-called primitives, who were the most civilized people I have ever met because at first they recognized my humanity. When you live among people you've never seen before, when they make you welcome, fix special foods for you because they think you came from an alien land, they have to fix something American for you when they fixed oatmeal for you, the, one of the few foods I didn't eat growing up, and I grew up poor, <laughs> and you eat every bit of it out of courtesy, you know that here is a people of warmth and kindness. And the interesting thing about this encounter is that I was in the hinterlands between Ghana and Togo, and I was with a man of the Ewe culture group. I don't use the word tribe because everybody in the world came out of a tribe. French is a tribe, English is a tribe. But when you use the word tribe toward us, you use it derogatory. So I just don't use it at all. When you use it for everybody, I use it for us. Now, the interesting thing is that they had put me up in their home and the wife was kidding the husband because he was a clerk in one of the local Barclay banks. And she said that every time when you married me, you promised to teach me to read. She spoke better English than he and she did not know how to read. And she said, Every time you promise me you're going to teach me how to read, you get me pregnant again. No more babies until you keep your promise. She wrote me back a year later and said that she had given birth to a child. She had learned how to read and she had actually written the letter she had written, she had uh, sent to me. And I remember the humanity of that meeting showed me how Africans behaved among Africans before Europeans came. And this is what we have lost. How then did we behave among each other? before this interference and we began to imitate other people's manners, other people's clothes, other people's food, and sometimes, tragically, other people's women. At what point did we become dissatisfied with the people at home? Because in that second incubator, you lost the original values of the first incubator. I wanted a lot about this change. And one day in Ghana, 